Hello, I'm Dr. Ron Eaglin coming to you from Daytona State College, and this is CEN 3722, Human Computer Interaction. And today we're going to talk about metaphors and conceptual models. And really, the beauty of this is it sounds like one of the most complex topics, but it's actually one of the easiest. So we're going to look at what are metaphors and what are conceptual models. And we deal with metaphors all the time in the real world, and we also deal with metaphors in computer systems. So a simple example of a metaphor in a computer system would be the recycle bin. You delete stuff, goes to the recycle bin, and you can either recycle it, which is essentially undeleting it, or you can empty the recycle bin and then it's all gone. That's a simple metaphor. So metaphors are very important to users because Users need metaphor to understand the complexity of systems. And what we really try to do is we try to take the tasks and the interface that they're working with and map that to something that they would already be familiar with. This does a good job of establishing the expectations of what a user thinks a system will do. It allows them to predict the behavior of the system. Users are much happier if they actually know what the system is going to do ahead of time, they do their actions, and the system does what they expect. Don't like the unexpected. So I'm going to give you an example here. The simple desktop of a computer is a metaphor. On the desktop, you've got things like a clipboard and a recycle bin and a trash and a file cabinets and calendars and clocks. All these are typically on the desktop of almost every computer system. However, it's a little more complex than that when you're dealing with the, with the metaphors that, are de- that you'd have with user interfaces. Most common computer users were very familiar with the interface of Windows 7 because it was built on XP, which was built on NT, which was built on um, Windows 95, which was built on Windows 3. And each step along the progression of the development of these user interfaces was a simple progression, more functionality, but relatively straightforward ability to build a metaphor from the previous system to the new system with some changes. Then we jumped to Windows 8 and introduced an entirely new metaphor, which actually had nothing in the background that people could use, this concept of tiles. Well, if people know the history of what happened with Windows 8, it was pretty soundly rejected by most users And Windows took one step backwards to the old Windows 7 interface in the introduction of Windows 10. They kept the tiles, but they moved them kind of out of the way and just used the basic functionality of what was good about tiles, but kept that old standard metaphor of the Windows 7 to Windows 10. Okay, in that case, it was a metaphor of a user interface to another user interface. Let's look at these metaphors. So three types of metaphors that we're dealing with here, the verbal, the virtual, and the composite. The verbal metaphor is the straightforward typewriter to keyboard, okay? Real simple, here's your old thing that people might have a familiarity with, moving to a new one that people hopefully can become familiar with because it's so similar to the previous one. The virtual metaphor actually adds something that really has a hard time having a real-world analogy. Okay, the concept of moving something from one place of your office to another is one thing when you're doing it in the real world, you literally pick it up and move it. But in the computer world, you've got this concept of having to click on something and drag it, which is something that's kind of interesting. So the drag drop is a metaphor to picking up and moving, okay? And that is a virtual metaphor because it really is unique to the virtual world. And then a composite metaphor adds something new to those other metaphors. Okay, so we've now got the desktop metaphor with all of its little metaphors of the clock and the calendar and all that. But now we add menus, which really isn't something you typically see in an office in the real world unless you're not working in a restaurant. Okay, but yeah, it's, but those are different types of metaphors. That ability to actually add on to an existing metaphor with a composite metaphor is still gives you a lot of power in your design. So um, a conceptual model is how you conceptualize a system. You as a user, you as a designer. Either way, you're going to have a concept of a system and how it works. Now, the designer's job is to understand the user's conceptual model. 
As a designer, you will have your own conceptual model, but it may not be the user's conceptual model. You must understand the user's conceptual model and you must provide a level of consistency, okay? Now, in a good system, you don't need any documentation. A well-designed system, those conceptual models match, they mesh perfectly, the user is able to conceptualize how the thing's gonna work, it works the way they expected it to work, and there's no documentation needed, and it fits within the metaphors that their brain can build from past experience. An incredibly solid user experience, and these things do happen. There are systems that gain instant acceptance, and users absolutely love them, and they typically do very well. So let's look at some of, you know, just some pictures of some different types of models. So here is a phone system from IBM, okay? This was dramatically different from the pre-existing phone systems, but it added huge amounts of functionality. You had a frequently called list, okay? One-touch dialing, which was very convenient because the old phones never had one-touch dialing. You had to, you know, you actually had to dial, and we still use the term dial. Okay, there's another concept, you know, another metaphor. We went from dialing phones that actually had rotary dials to pushing buttons to pushing a single button. And of course, now with um, the types of phones that exist today, you've simply got a contact list that you pick out your contact and hit it. You don't even worry about remembering the numbers anymore. Okay, but this is a user interface that users were able to conceptualize and know how it was going to work. Now, let's look at some evolution of some interfaces. So in the very early days of the computers, they all came, well, they didn't all come, they actually came before CD players were, were around. But as CDs were introduced, and CDs could be used to either hold music or data, they would have a CD player. And this CD player is actually a very busy interface. But what it does is it makes everything visible to the user. So it's not necessarily the prettiest of interfaces, as you'll see as we move forward, but it has a high level of visibility because we're trying to take the metaphor of a CD that plays music and an actual CD player that's actually built on the metaphor of a turntable and a record. There's no, you know, there's a reason why CDs are round and look like records, okay? That level of acceptance, okay? Now, moving forward, a CD player today looks something like this. And if you notice, there's not a tremendous amount of visibility of the different controls. And if you don't have the mouse hovering over the actual CD player at all, at a given point in time, there's no visibility of the controls at all. It's simply the cover of the album, which is still kind of an interesting thing because you know, well, there's the cover of the album. It's playing. How do I get control to it? Well, now the interface is you mouse hover over it and the interface controls show up, but a minimal set of interface controls, not all the information you were given in the previous design. Now, of course, we also allow the users to have a higher level of control of the interface. So the same CD player, which is, is this, this is simply Windows Media Player, has a alternate interface, which gives you more information. But in this information, it's information about what are the tracks that are available, what's playing, where does it exist in the system. Okay. Again, good, these are good designs. These are, these are very well accepted designs that work for many, many people. So let's give another example. The gold, the old thermostats, and I'm sure people still have old thermostats, which had two dials, one for how hot do you want to be, one for how cold do you want it to be, and then a little thing that goes in between that shows where you actually are at. That's a relatively straightforward and simple design. If you actually think about it, it is very simplistic. And they also came on with an on, auto, and off switch. Now, as the thermostats gained more and more functionality, like the ability to program them for program them for different times of day. They became more complex, but they still tried to keep a level of interface design that users could manage. Simple, four, five, six, six buttons maximum. This one has individual modes, and modes are something that I've always said stay away from if you possibly can, but sometimes you can't stay away from them. But modes aren't necessarily bad. It's just that you have to indicate to a user if you're in a mode, so that, they don't, uh, so that they understand the set of actions that are available to them are dependent upon the mode the system is in. 
Well, if you move forward one step further to a more modern thermostat, such as a Nest, which is actually an intuitive thermostat, and I actually encourage all of you to go out and at least go to Lowe's or Home Depot, if you don't have one of these, and play with it and see how it's become a level of intuitive design. The Nest goes one step further in that it actually learns your patterns of behavior. If you turn the air up during the day, your air conditioning to 78, let's say, and you turn it down at night, let's say to 72, it learns that mode of behavior and actually is able to do it automatically. I'm gonna look at a couple more interfaces here. And this one's interesting because this is an interface. And the question here is, is this an interface from a car or is this an interface from a computer? Well, the reality of this is, is that this is a screen capture from a computer that is trying to emulate the functionality of what you would see in a console of a car. And it does look almost exactly like the console of a car with a radio player and other types of controls. Okay, again, building on the metaphor. And this actually is a car. And again, I'm just showing you a number of interfaces, but this is a, the interface is also, and the reason I like this one is because this is a very pleasant interface, but pleasant in that it has a level of cool. Cool factor is still important, okay? And we'll call it the cool factor, that people look at it and it's an attractive level of design, but it's an attractive design that gives them the information that they actually need and want to have and understand. Put all of that together and you have an incredibly, you'll have incredibly successful user designs. You can have the best program in the world with incredible functionality, but if your user interface isn't something that users want, they're going to reject it. So understanding that ease of use, the ability to learn, just all of those things come together into that user interface. So what happens is that the user acceptance is really going to be based on that interface and it's going to be based upon the metaphors and the conceptual models that they build in their mind. And understanding those metaphors and conceptual models becomes very important because the bottom line is if the users don't like the interface, they don't like Windows 8, they're going to reject it. And that leads to product failure. And you don't want that. So hopefully you've caught all of this background information about the metaphors and the conceptual models as we move forward and we start actually dealing with users and the actual design process itself, which is where we're going to be going. Understanding the metaphors and understanding the concept of a conceptual model and how conceptual models are built will be important to you designing really useful systems that users accept. Hope we're getting it all. Thank you very much. It's Dr. Ron England. This is Heading out from Daytona State College.